everybody. Um, it's nice to see a few of you, although it's, this, it's December, <laughs> a lot of you probably have gone um, for Christmas holidays. Today we have a very exciting lecture uh, by Chris Hudson, the principal, principal designer at Chris Hudson Designs, and the lecture will be on the role of local communities in preserving and promoting heritage in a Ecuadorian case study. And um, just very briefly to introduce Chris, uh, Chris has a degree in 3D design and a postgraduate degree in development planning uh, from UCL and began work at the British Museum Exhibition Office and went on to run the British volunteer program in Ecuador and design for archaeological museums in Ecuador and Peru. In the UK, he designed the Kilmartin House Museum, Sutton Hoo Interpretation, Cloister Gallery at Dorchester Abbey. He is interested in the contribution uh, museums and archaeology make to cultural confidence and identity, and teaches on the public archaeology um, program at the UCL Institute of Archaeology, where I also graduated from. So we have a lot of uh, shared interest, actually, and experiences. So looking forward to that lecture. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, some of you may know my face as a regular attendee of these, these seminars. I never expected to be this end of the room until earlier this year, the then speaker mentioned the UNESCO Convention and one item in it that refers to the role of local communities in preserving heritage. And I thought, oh, I have a story about that that uh, I, is quite inspiring. So I offered the talk, and here I am. Um, here's some food for thought. <laughs> we'll come back to that. Where are we? This is Ecuador um, on the west coast of South America. Um, and this is the village of Agua Blanca, which is in the green area, which is the Machalilla National Park. It's in a river valley that um, exhibits a particular kind of tropical um, climate known as dry forest. It's very opportunistic. It will rain heavily in January and February and this stuff will grow this high in about three weeks <laughs> um, and then be harvested or, or used in some way and then die back for most of the rest of the year. Um, further, uh, the village is actually on one side of the, the, the valley, and you'll see in the distance, whoa, wrong button, right, uh, this is the centre point of, a, of quite a large archaeological site which shows all the Ecuadorian prehistoric uh, occupations going back to Valdivia, which is about 4,000 BC, but the main occupation would have been 8 to 9 to 1000 AD, a Mantegna occupation. Um, so this is how the village was in uh, the late 80s when I was first there, traditional tropical architecture. Um, this is the archaeological site, this is reversing the last slide, so we're now on the, the Monticulo, the, the the hill in the middle, and there's the, uh, there's the village. And these are the stone structures. There are large public-sized stone structures, not domestic-sized structures. Um, they're largely just footings, but it, it is an interesting <coughs> site for many reasons. Um, one of the reasons that it has uh, anything up to about 20 of these stone seats. Um, you'll see a complete one later, but you might see some feet there. It's a crouching cat feline of some sort, and then it will have a stone seat on the top. Um, these are, uh, a colleague who, who did his research at the site refers to them as seats of power. They're very symbolic Mantegna seats, and there's lots of them that on site. They're all broken. So they were ritually ended for some reason. This is, these are villagers working on the excavation. Um, Colin McEwen, the archaeologist 
graduating from Illinois in anthropology, who worked there, um, works in a particularly unique way. He, he doesn't hire students and uh, take a whole team in. He will go to a site and work with local people who gain training and knowledge in the, in the process. This is, for instance, it's a Mantegna burial with one urn on top of another that was found in a flood water gully near to the village. These are villagers um, working on post-excavation, cleaning and reconstruction in the village hall, which became a laboratory for the first season of, of the, uh, the excavation. And this is, these are villagers reconstructing ceramics. The National Park was created in the 60s. Um, at that time, the village, the village's traditional activities were charcoal burning, <coughs> charcoal burning, hunting, and tree felling. There's tropical hardwood in, in, in the forest further up the valley. Um, so what does the National Park do? It bans those three activities, but makes no attempt to replace the traditional ac economic activities of the village with, with, with other work. So from day one of the formation of the park, there was tension between the park authorities and, um, uh, um, and, and the, um, the villagers, which may explain why they're quite a, it's quite a unique community, why it's quite united. So there's charcoal burning. Um, Colin, one of Colin's um, ideas was he managed to get some funding out of the US Embassy and the British Embassy um, to fund irrigation for horticultural plots. So each family in the village has a horticultural plot where they grow enough produce for their own consumption and maybe some surplus. Um, the village is called Agua Blanca. There's a clue in the name. They have a water source further up the valley, which is white sulfurous water, but it's perfectly good for consumption and for um, irrigation. I was working at a village um, on the coast about an hour's journey away, and Colin would come down at weekends for uh, free food, booze, snooker, and conversation. And I was invited up to the village. And after a few visits to the village, they persuaded me to help them build a display for the village hall. Well, um, this was the very simple display that we produced. Um, but you'll see there is an intact Mantegno seat in the, the, the centerpiece of the display. Um, the story behind that is, is fantastic. The villagers were digging in the village to put in water pipes to actually run the sulfurous water to a tap beside ev every, every, ho every house. And this stone seat was, was dug up intact. Colin saw this happen. Everybody got very excited. It was immediately sold to a lorry driver who came up every Saturday to take the women down to town with the laundry that they took in from the towns on the coast who only had saline water. So they had smelly but non-saline water, which was good for laundry. Um, Colin didn't intervene. It was sold by the person who found it t for the, about a month's salary, the equivalent of a month's wages, to the truck driver. But in the meantime, we were building this display, and this, the stone seat was discussed. And they thought, well, that ought to be the centerpiece of the display. Um, and every Saturday, the truck driver comes back to the village. And so, bit by bit, a sort of cultural blackmail is, is uh, brought about in which he's introduced to other visitors as the guy who's going to donate the stone seat to our display. Well, the time went on. It was the Friday before the Saturday opening of the display, no sign of the seat. And all of a sudden, the truck appears with the stone seat. He didn't want his money back. He knew that his interests were best represented by keeping the trade with the women to take them to market and to take their laundry in over, you know, for endless Saturdays rather than a, a, a month's wages. Um, so that was the first example of, of sort of cultural 
awareness that the, the village had. The other thing I got involved in, we designed a visitor circuit for the site and we put in steps, and we put in shelters because we're in the tropics at sea level on the equator, so um, not a cold place. We built these shelters and tables which later contained relief maps of the site. Then someone had the bright idea of building their own museum. So, of course, I do sketches on the back of an envelope sort of thing. And a couple of years later, hear that they've got the funding. So I go back to Ecuador on an airfare paid by the British Council, and we start building the museum. I'm not actually an architect, but <laughs> don't tell anyone. It's not yet fallen down. Um, there's a tradition in the Andes, possibly Inca or pre-Inca, of a Minga, which is a collective work group. You, the, anybody can call a Minga. The person who calls the Minga provides food and booze, and people give their labour free. So build, digging the foundations for the footings of, of our building was done by a Minga um, amongst the villagers. The rest of the work was done by 12 carpenters who were, who were paid um, from the funding that had been, been achieved. So this is the Minga. It's traditional tropical architecture, wooden posts set in the ground um, with a floor level. It's on a sloping site, so it helps to level the site. Um, and very quickly, whoops. The first thing we came across, of course, you dig any holes in that area, you come across archaeology. So on the doorstep of the museum, we had a small, the, the foundations of a small enclosure. So they call the archaeological team, which is a, a group of 15 to 20 um, men in the village who are experienced in, in excavating by now, because they've worked with Colin for three or four years. And they excavate it and record it, and then we carry on building. Fortunately, it was beside the building, not right underneath it. Another idea of the village president was that the school kids should be given the morning off work to bring stones for the footings from a nearby quarry. Um, these kids are now in their 40s <laughs> and very much feel that they helped build this, this building, their museum. Um, so th that I, th I thought that was a total brainwave. Um, here's a much younger <coughs> me with the team of carpenters. Um, and I produced a balsa. For those who are interested, balsa wood comes from Ecuador, basically. It's, it's a large source of, of balsa wood because it's a tropical product. So we, we, I made a balsa wood model which served as drawings for the museum because it shows the framework and what goes where when I wasn't on site. So if I had to go into Guayaquil, which is four hours away, to get supplies or whatever, um, the model stayed on site and told them what to do. So here's the, from the footings, you get three, three meter lengths of um, eight by eight tropical hardwood, which we asked the National Park for permission to fell. And then you, you do these amazing joints that make them lock together and you go up as high, high as you can. So there's the framework taking place. It's um, going to be clad with split bamboo. The other thing that grows in Ecuador is the thickest bamboo in the world. You know bamboo is anything from this sort of thing, sort of section. Ecuadorian bamboo is this wide. They use it as scaffold poles to build skyscrapers. It's structural bamboo. Here's a bit coming in. It's then split up into lengths. It's opened up, split up into lengths with a machete for cladding. Here it is going on the building. If you've seen any other tropical buildings, you'll see that the bamboo cladding goes on vertically. Here we decided to put it on horizontally for the reason that we're also planning to put a daub mix on top of it. And it's a wet um, straw, earth, and uh, manure mixture <laughs> that will slip down less quickly if you put the bamboo horizontal, because it will catch it. If you put it vertical, it would never stick. Um, and it's roofed with 
palm from the tagua palm. The tagua palm is a, has a nut on it this size that is a natural sort of ivory. It's very white and very hard. And the palm leaves um, are used to thatch tropical architecture, uh, tropical houses. Um, there's the roof going on. Um, this is, then there's the kincha, the, the daub mix. I won't ask people to do anything I'm not prepared to do, so I have trod this mix along with the workforce, um, and it's made of donkey manure, water, straw, and earth, and you have to soak it for a couple of days. It's uh, the dry pellets that you collect from the many donkeys in the valley um, are quite inoffensive. After it's soaked for two days, it's not quite so inoffensive. <laughs> And you can have wonderful conversations <laughs> in Spanish if your topic of conversation is manure. <laughs> and here it is going on. It's the first time this technique had been used in this village. We twice sent a motorbike on a four-hour journey to pick up someone who knew how to do it, and he, did, he never showed. So the village president, who is the man on the left there, he dug a pit beside his house and produced a bit of the mixture and did experiments on his <laughs> own house to see if it would work. Um, and we learned very quickly that you have to put it on in two layers, because one thick layer will fall off, but two thin layers will work better. And um, we also learned that um, the trees and the seeds and things that the donkeys eat start to germinate in the mix. So <laughs> on day two after application, you've got sprouts coming out of the wall. But we, and if you just pull them, the whole thing uh, material would come off. But we learned if you left them there in the, as, as the kincha dried out, they would dry out and die and you could just cut them off with a knife. Um, alternative technology. The, te the lintels over the doors and windows were too plain to provide a texture for the door to stick to. So these are Coca-Cola tops nailed to the lintel the wrong way around. It works a treat. This is the finished building. It's tropical architecture. It's, it's got a space underneath which provides um, a level area and a sloping site. Um, it's got a steep roof because for palm thatch, if you have a shallow roof, it will perforate. Rain will go through. But if you have a steeper roof, it will run off. Um, it's also got, it's not glazed. It has, whoa, wrong button. Uh, it's not glazed. It has um, Venetian windows, and it has a grill. I looked around the village and the, at other tropical architecture and copied every, all the good ideas. So this grill at the top of all the walls um, provides ventilation and daylight to the building. It, it, when it first opened, there was no electricity in the village. Um, and then this is our doorstep exhibit. This is the archaeology we found, and it's now roped off and visible from, from the the patio, and that's the overall building. It's by far the biggest building in the village, but it was designed in a way that breaks down, breaks down the volume and looks, looks in scale to other buildings in the village. Also, we, we made a choice because the village architecture is very hybrid. There's, there's traditional wooden frames, split bamboo and palm thatch, but then there's variations like corrugated iron roofs, breeze block walls, brick walls, um, no timber frame houses built on the ground, but we took we made a conscious decision to use traditional materials first of all for economy uh, they were by far cheaper because they were readily available in walking distance, and also they 're the coolest it 's the coolest building in the village. Not only do you get insulation from the palm thatch ventilation from uh, the the air through the grills and the windows. Um, but the quincha, we, we rendered, we put the daub on the outside and the inside of the walls because it preserves the bamboo and stops woodworm getting into the bamboo. But you end up with a, a wall thickness of this size, which is effectively ceiling board. It's a fibre board, uh, which re insulates really well. So it, it turned out to be the coolest building in the village. Um, one thing we had to do, we had to put a grill around here because all the pigs and goats from near and far would come and enjoy the shade. And if you've got pigs and goats under your building, it starts to smell. Um, there's a porch. 
Again, I looked around the village and I noticed that um, there were one or two places that sold beers that had shade and an outside porch. And people would gather there in the evening. And I thought, this is a building for the village as well as for visitors. So I want it to be hospitable. And before we had finished the building, this porch had a gathering of people in it um, in, in the evenings drinking beer. This is the inside. The display is very simple. They're, they're silicon glass cubes um, dropped onto plywood plinths, but we added some bright colours. And this wall display... Uh, the wall display is photos of villagers, who have many of whom have a typical um, pre-Columbian profile. The, the type... Of the, the Mantegno nose, which is found on the ceramics, is also found on, on the people. Um, so we interspersed it with two, cera two ceramic figures up to the same scale mm -hmm. with members of the, the village. But uh, so it sort of says continuity. This is the, the building in its context. So remember this drawing, this, this photo. This is the village when the museum was inaugurated. We're going to come back to that. So that was the situation when I left in, I think it was 90, 1990 when it was opened. I went back five years later and then learned subsequently what had happened in the intervening years. Um, the original archaeological program was funded by the National Bank of Ecuador. Um, don't ask me why, but in South America banks are into art and archaeology and culture. I think it's seen to be investing in national identity. Um, they, the village approached them and every other year or every two or three years would organise what they, a cultural encounter they called it, an uh, encuentro cultural, in which people from all communities all over the country would gather for three or four days at Agua Blanca. They'd have speakers, they'd have archaeologists, they'd have films, they'd have parties, they'd have guided tours of the, the, um, the site. Uh, what else has happened? The vi village, principally women, but not exclusively, started making handcrafts to sell to the increased visitors that they got to the museum. Um, word got around and Agua Blanca became a destination, a tourist destination. Um, and they, the people who uh, worked in the archaeology team set up a guiding team. The story behind this is remarkable. Um, funding run out, ran out for a six-month program of excavations every year. Um, Colin had finished his doctorate, so it, there was no more funding available. Um, they, the, the 20 strong people team of, of uh, archaeologists or excavators in the village met, and someone stood up and said, I think it's in our interest to volunteer to look to maintain the archaeological site because that's what people come to visit. When they come to visit, we make money out of them. Anybody who's not interested in this, please leave now. So eight people left the room, and the 12 who were left formed the archaeological, t the, the guiding team, um, and who are now paid from an income from admissions to the museum and, and to, to the site. Well then, this is the, the view, if you remember, this is the view from that we saw earlier. This is the same view with many more buildings with a much more developed village because I went back in 2014, 2015, almost 25 years after we'd opened the museum, to see what had happened. And I spent three weeks with them because um, I was really curious to see what had happened. So what had happened? First of all, they'd got electricity. <laughs> and electricity means televisions. Um, they always had radios, so they were quite well informed, but they weren't totally um, hypnotised by having TVs. Um, the other community I worked at on the coast had electricity and had TVs, was a much more passive community. Agua Blanca was a much more active community because they had to make their own entertainment. <laughs> and the history of, of battle with the, um, 
uh, with the National Park. They've got a new school. They've lobbied the local authorities to build them a new school, a new primary school. They had a new village hall. Uh, they have electricity, so they got television. <coughs> Increased household uh, incomes, I think it says, earnings. And, and women on, bike, on motorbikes. Um, the number of donkeys has diminished enormously uh, um, because people have, there are about a dozen motorbikes and one or two cars in the village. The road from the coast up to the village, which usually used to be a totally dirt boat road, has now been paved. They're visible. They put a sign on the main road um, to, to advertise their existence and to entice visitors in. And this used to be the, the kiosk where the National Park charged admission to the National Park. Now, some years before I was there in 1415, um, the National Park had decided not to charge visitors anymore. It was going to be free. So the village lobbied the National Park and said, but we're offering a service. Can we still charge for what we do? And the park agreed. So currently, the guiding team, which includes one, included one, the first woman, um, when I was there, charges $6 a head for a, guided, a two hour guided tour of the, of the village and the flora and the fauna and the archaeology. And you end up in the sulphur pool, which is they developed as a sort of spa. Of the six dollars, five dollars goes into a pool, uh, a pot, which at the end of the month is divided up between 20 guides. They work three shifts over the month. The other dollar goes into the village fund for project development and administration because they're always looking for new things to do and you'll see some of the, the other things they've done. So they, they've thought, first of all, about equal distribution because if you just took... There will be busy days and quiet days, but if you divide up a pot at the end of the month, all the workers, whether they've had a, a lot of trade or not much trade, get the same pay. And they've also thought about a levy to invest in future developments in the village. This it was a, a, a busy day. I think it was the, the, a couple of days before Christmas in 2014. Um, outside the museum. They've, um, lobbied, they raised funds and lobbied the National Park to get signage put in. So here you've got the sort of a map of the village, uh, the river valley, and the things that are on, on offer. You mustn't hunt, you mustn't pick flowers, you mustn't run dogs loosely because of the wild animals. Um, and, the, and these are the guiding team. So these are some of the guys you saw holding rocks. Mm. Um, they're now in their 30s, 20s and 30s, and they helped build the museum, and they're part of the guiding team. They have their own um, polo shirts with, with the Agua Blanca logo. Um, and the National Park has offered them training in, in guiding. The National Park has various levels. You can be a park ranger, which means you're free to take people to the um, island, off, off, offshore islands on the coast. You guide people around the National Park. And then they have a, a level of guiding that is a, a community guide. Um, you have to have your basic reading and writing. Also, to become a guide, you have to offer um, a month's free labour, so that's one shift over the month. So they can, they can uh, check out if you're able uh, and see if you'd fit into the team. There's one other criteria for being a member of the guiding team, that is you have to come from a household that is not yet represented on the guiding team. They've thought about income distribution, which is pretty darn smart. Um, I, I, you can, if, you, if you're an older guide and you retire, you can allocate uh, a son or a daughter or, or a nephew or a, or a grandchild to take your post. Um, so, you know, nepotism is also there. Um, this is um, Jenny, the one female guide. Um, 
briefing on, on the porch of the museum, <coughs> briefing visitors on what's available and what they'd like to do. Uh, this is another, the map they're shown and can choose what to do. They're first of all taken around the exhibition, which since I, we opened it has been spruced up and extended. They've added a, a third again, no, half again to the exhibition hall since I was there before. And they've repeated the module exactly um, so it's seamless. It's not, you can't see there's been any extension at all. Um, so this is Carlos, I think. Or is it? This is a guy called Clever um, leading a, a tour. They've, up, they've updated the, the photos a bit. They've got colour photos now in the displays and added more exhibits. There's a model balsa raft. They've updated, they've improved the paths. This is the, the, the burial site that you saw earlier, but they've now got glass covers on and they have a, a roof over it. Um, you can watch birds. There's a, I forget the name, but a bird with a long tail and wonderful colors. This is Carlos, I believe, at the beginning of his tour. Now, I, I, I tracked one or two tours to see what the content was. He's not only telling them about the archaeology, the flora and the fauna and the characteristics of the area. He also has a pitch that says, well, we're a small village of about 40 families and we live by tourism and by horticulture um, and some of, some of us are guides, some of us work as park guides in, in, in on the coast, etc. So they communicate personal I in in information as well as scientific information. Um, they've brought in a tagua palm and one or two other plants from further up the valley so that they have examples on the tour to, to show people. Um, um, they go past the horticultural plots, there's maize. They've got a campsite. You, I think they charge about $4 <coughs> a night for camping. Um, a dollar of which will go into the general fund for admin and project development. Um, this is the foot of a cyborg tree, um, and there's a sign here that says, let's respect the cyborg. Nature is life. This is the archaeological site, which they fenced off because of goats. Goats can do a lot of damage. Um, and this is Carlos with one of the orientating visitors at one of the balsa relief models that we had built some years earlier. They've even left the, um, the grid marking out of the, uh, of the excavations because they like to explain what archaeology is. So they've left an archaeological site with the pegs in uh, and everything. Um, there's the group again. And then hour, hour and a half later, they bring them to the sulfur pool, which they have um, embanked and built up. It's about 20 foot deep in the middle. It's got a strong smell of sulfur, but it's really smooth and nice. Uh, in that temperature, at 4 o'clock every afternoon, it's really nice to fall into this pool. They've also, um, the, the National Park helped them build changing rooms and toilets near the pool. Uh, and they dredge some, th there's a pool attendant who works full time, I think there's two pool attendants, who dredge up mud from the bottom of the pool every morning and it's offered to you for a face pack or a body pack or whatever before you then wash it off in the pool because it's, it's very smooth. Um, they've also, when I was there, they'd sent away samples of the water for testing um, to see, because they, they'd been telling people it's good for you but they didn't really know if that <laughs> was true. Um, I haven't yet heard the results, but uh, it can't be bad for you, because I'm still here. They built lookout points, which provide a view across the valley, so you can see further up the valley to the, the hill, the coastal hills, which have another um, microclimate called cloud forest, where you get lots of orchids and bromeliads that live in the trees, in the moisture that the cloud produced by hills brings. 
uh, they built a bigger handcraft centre and there's a whole committee and group of people dedicated to handcrafts. Uh, these are many of the things. These are pretty well all locally produced items um, for sale. Uh, in particular, there's the spondylus shell. The spiny oyster is characteristic. You only find it from the Gulf of Guayaquil up to the Bahia in uh, northwest Me Mexico. That's its ecological range. But it's a type of, and it's got this orange, sometimes purple, um, lining in, in the shell, um, which was traded in prehistoric times four or five thousand years BC. So it must have come from Ecuadorian waters, but it's found in Chile. So it must have been traded from Ecuador. Um, and they've learned to work it. Um, they've invested in equipment. This is someone cutting up shells with a, an angle grinder. Um, They've also, there's a tree there called Palo Santo whose bark produces a very scented oil. Um, they've learned, but you can, you only extract it from fallen branches, from dead branches. So it's an acceptable practice as far as the national park is concerned. You mustn't fell trees, but you can pick up trees. They've learned how to extract the oil with a pressure cooker and they sell it in jars. It's very good for keeping mosquitoes away and things like that. Um, they also had raised money for a project, I forget the charity, but an American charity funded building materials for households that wished to participate to add a building to their house for tourist accommodation. You will pay anything from four to six or seven dollars a night for a night in Agua Blanca, a dollar of which goes to the central fund <laughs> for admin and project development. Um, about 20 families participated in this. They had to give their labor free, but building materials were provided. Uh, this is another one. And they've largely um, chosen to build with traditional materials rather than brick and breeze block and tin. But I'd noticed that some villagers had built their own cabins who were outside of this project. This was the most deluxe cabin <laughs> which they gave me to stay in when I was there, which has a plumbed toilet and bathroom. And I referred to them as the private enterprise cabins. And I said, um, what about the private enterprise cabins? We take a dollar off them. <laughs> for uh, admin and project development. And also they have a list of the families that offer hospi hospitality and they work down the list. It's so that the guides are prevented from always taking tourists back to their mum's uh, room to the rent. So they, they have a strict rotor. So they said the private enterprise cabins, they're on the list. So they, they get their fair share of trade, no more, no less, and they pay their levy. Um, they also raised money for a community restaurant. This restaurant is capable of feeding, I think, 120 people goat stew, which is the local delicacy, if you give them two hours notice in order to kill the goats. Um, <laughs> the, hang on, they t 10 cents per plate of food sold in this restaurant goes to the Central Fund for Admin and Project Development. Now this was really interesting too. In, in a, the local town, nearest town, which is about two hours drive away, Porto Viejo, there's a university. And they run, they run a course in tourism. At least once a year they send 20 or 30 students to stay in the village for two days um, to learn from Agua Blanca's experience on dealing with tourists. And so this is the village president, Raul, giving a lecture to the students about what it's like, how they manage tourists in their own community. But imagine a largely uneducated community becoming aware that they have something to teach university students. 
I think that's pretty smart, personally. Um, they have a project to build a new museum. This is the old village hall, which was uh, called the Casa Comunal. As soon as we opened the museum, it was known as the Casa Cultural, um, which was quite nice. Well, it's now becoming known as the Casa Republicana because they want to open a museum about the historic period in the village from the conquest from the 16th century up to the present. Um, so they've started collecting items and reconstructing household, whoops, household items um, for, for this museum, but it's not fully funded yet. Um, but th they want another attraction in the village and they want to talk about their lives and their history. They're on the map. This is uh, a tourist map found in the local, the nearest town, which is Puerto Lopez here. And you can see one of the, the larger tourist offers, mm -hmm. as well as Puerto Lopez, um, is from Agua Blanca. This was the other site where I was working originally, where there's also a museum. Um, so they're on the map. Um, <coughs> they're in the handbook. Agua Blanca is mentioned in the um, Lonely Planet Guide in very favorable terms. It's also mentioned in the, uh, the rough guide. So they're, they're, they're really on the map, and the, so the visitor numbers are improving. They sell tickets. At the gate, you pay your $6 um, to come in. Um, they keep a register in the museum. So they have kept visitor statistics because they know that visitor, the number of visitors you can boast will attract funding for projects. So that's the, the visitor book. And you can see they've adopted as a logo the, the stone seat, which is on all their T-shirts. Annual visitors. I managed to update the stats when I was there. I spent a couple of nights at, with a calculator um, adding up the last four years because I only had stats up to about um, 2010, I think. Um, and you can see that it's gone up phenomenally. The average annual increase is 27% over, over the previous year. So that they've been very successful at attracting visitors. Um, but I was also interested in looking at how their visitors compared to overall number of visitors to the National Park. Um, Let's see if we've got. And you'll see that the share, if you, if you look at the National Park visitors, this is the percentage, these are the visitors to Agua Blancas, who will be part of this, this number. Their share was 6%. By 2007, it was 29% uh, over the, you see, this has kept fairly stable, the visitor numbers, whereas this has gone up. So that by their activities, they're attracting an ever-increasing percentage of the National Parks visitors. Um, I've mentioned the village president. Uh, how are they organized? The Comuna is a legal entity just below parish council level. So here we have parish councils, but we have nothing below that. But the Comuna is an elected body um, you have a committee of about eight people. You have a president, you have a secretary, you have a treasurer. They're, they're allowed to levy, levy subs from all households in, in the village to pay for their activities. They'll meet once a month, and meet, meetings might be four or five or six hours long. Um, but, but people turn up, and it's the main forum for the exchange of information and news and the discussion of, of what's happening in the village. Um, this is probably too long a story to include, but it, ask me later. Um, they've also uh, had a pipeline put near the village um, for, uh, I think, oil, because Ecuador has oil. And the team from the village is called in to oversee the canal building. 
the, the trench digging for, for the oil, the oil ducks. Um, so the village are, no, are respected as an authority. They've also said um, any digging that happens here has to be by hand. You can't bring in bulldozers. We are archaeologically sensitive terrain. And these are some of the Mantegna burial pots that have come out of those trenches. And so and the authorities respect that they have a knowledge of the archaeology that their contractors do not have. Um, but the most interesting thing I found out while I was there, incidentally on Christmas Day in 2014, because um, I was going around interviewing people, and I, a guy said, well, my wife's gone to town with the kids. He said, I've nothing to do. Come and interview me. <laughs> so, and I noticed on his wall was this plan. It's a plan of nationalities and peoples of Ecuador. It's produced by the Home Office, uh, the Ministry of the Interior. Um, a people is a language, a nationality is a language group. So there will be Quechua, there will be Shah, Shua, Shua, there will be Spanish, there will be a lot of groups in the Amazon, for instance. Uh, and a people is an identity group within that language group. So you will get the Otavalans, for instance, who wear a pigtail. You will get another group who have a distinctive poncho, etc., etc. You get the Kayapas on the coast who paint their face red. Um, uh, so it's, it's a map of, because uh, in recent years, Ecuador has been marketing itself as a polycultural nation. Um, and anybody who can get enough signatures together can lobby the Home Office and get on the map. So <laughs> while you've got lots of different groups in the Sierra, this is the Andes coming up here, and in the Amazon, there's very few groups on the coast, except I noticed a couple of groups, this brown one and this one. Um, you look over here and this says Manta. So this is identified as the area where the people have chosen to be identified as Pueblo Manta. Incidentally, this other one, this grey area here, is Pueblo uh, Juan Cavilca. Both of these names come from archaeology. The, the pre-Spanish culture on the coast is, was named by archaeologists as uh, Cultura Juancavilca Manteña, or Manteño Juancavilca. Um, so two whoops, groups of communities have uh, chosen to be identified by a pre-Columbian name. Um, and I thought that was pretty remarkable. I thought it was especially remarkable as um, they've chosen to name themselves with terms that th have been given by archaeologists, so related to the culture. Now, without doubt, most people on the coast are of mixed race. They will be mestizo, they will be half Spanish, they will be half indigenous but they have made a conscious choice to be named by a pre-Columbian term, i.e. they didn't want to be identified as Spanish because they were the invaders. Um, which brings us back to our bar of chocolate. This is um, a face, a graphic derived from the faces of the Valdivia, the first ceramics in the Americas, which were found on the coast of Ecuador, they're called Valdivia. They have named the chocolate Valdivian chocolate. Cul pre archaeology, prehistory, cultural identity is now commerce. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you very much. That's very inspiring. A lot to learn and possibly, hopefully, implement actually here in Europe. So. The floor is open for questions. Yes, if you don't mind uh, to introduce yourself, that would be great. Uh, yes, you. my name is Claire Richards. I'm an architect with a particular interest in sustainable communities in the UK. Very big question. What do you think is the key lesson for communities here where built heritage <coughs> is protected, but 
social heritage isn't really even on the map. It's much more complex here because we have a much denser population. In isolated village, and there are, there are cases in Scotland, for instance, where villages have created their own museums and their own tourist um, networks. Um, but it's more complicated. But I always think that if you want a project to be sustainable, start with felt needs. Mm. Don't fly in and say, this will be good for you, mm. because the chances are it won't. Mm. But do your homework, do your research, get to know the community, and find out what they think is going to work for their community, which will be unique, and work with that. And they, they, will, they will take it on board. But if you come in and say, a museum, a road, a water, a water work, a factory, this is going to be good for you, the chances are they'll say, prove it. <laughs> <laughs> they will be quite sceptical uh, if, if they're smart. So start with felt needs. I, I think it's fundamental to any development project um, here or abroad. Um, My name is Bernard Miller. I'm a high training a planner and architect. Studied at the same place with Chris, and I'm an old friend. Just wanted to thank you for that talk, which I thought was a really valuable guide to sustainable development of archaeology. Um, and I have a little request and a couple of questions. And the request is, could you tell us a little bit more about the archaeology that was discovered? Because although it was really exciting <laughs> discovering the process, I wonder if you can tell us just a bit. And um, the questions relate to how did the local population view their place in the world, the stuff that was around them, the things that you've now told them that are, are, are archaeology, before the archaeologists arrived and told them that that's what it was. Did they have a series of myths well, and developments? Stories? Fair enough. There has been archaeology happening in Agua Blanca for 50 years. Okay. Um, archaeologists will come in and do some work and go away. Probably the most sustained campaign um, was the one immediately prior to Colin's work and then Colin's work. Colin worked over a course of about six years there, um, going back for a six-month season every year. Um, uh, the, uh, what they discovered is, first of all, I said that they had every, every occupation, every cultural occupation in the Ecuadorian coastal prehistory. So it starts from Valdivia and comes all the way up to the conquest. There are about four different levels in that. The latest one is Mantenu, and the, the largest uh, occupation was Mantenu. The big buildings you saw are all Mantenu. They were clearly public buildings. Um, because they were of a scale not seen in, in domestic architecture. Um, they had these seats at regular intervals in the large spaces, um, which are clearly special. Um, at other points, adobe bricks this size had been used to level the hillside on a vast scale to, to be the footing for, for uh, a large structure. Um, there are out, even the village is on top of a suburb, if you like, of the archaeological site. That's why we found a stone seat there. Um, people have been finding uh, things in their back gardens or when they're tilling the fields or whatever for years. And they were encouraged to donate those to the museum. So we made very, sh I made very sure that their donation was acknowledged on the label for the object. Um, I think it's important to do that for donations. Um, so there's been a growing awareness of the uh, uh, of, of archaeology. The whole coast of Ecuador, probably the Mount the Sierra as well, was there was a, a large industry in grave robbing. Um, so the argument and, and some of the early the older villagers may well have been involved in that trade. And it's a big problem. But through working with archaeologists, the villagers have, have learned that 
um, an archaeological artifact, however beautiful or intact or precious it might be, is worth, in monetary terms, if nothing else, an awful lot more if it comes from a known context. Um, some of the more enlightened archaeologists have worked with grave robbers. They're called waqueros, because they make huacos, huecos, holes in the ground. Um, or they go to huacas. Um, they've involved waqueros in their archaeological teams um, because they have a knowledge, they have a sense of where to find things. They know that uh, a hill with a flat top means occupation. <laughs> um, they, they used to go around with steel rods and go in every metre, they'd stick it into the ground until they smashed a pot. <laughs> um, so slowly the mood is changing and people realise that, that, that artefacts excavated properly and housed on display locally will, uh, will present an economic value to the village. They're very hard-nosed. It's not that they're all wanting to be Mantegnos and everything <coughs> emotionally, um, but they're all, they also know that um, the archaeology is part of the tourism that brings them uh, a living. Um, but there was a nice story, for instance, about uh, a school kid who's now probably one of the older guides, who in his teens, th there wasn't a secondary school, there isn't a secondary school in, in uh, Agua Blanca, they have to go to Puerto Lopez. And the teacher knew that the, decided to have a bring and tell session at school and he lent on this 12 year old um, to bring along an archaeological piece to the, to the school and, and to talk about it in the lesson and then he was hoping p presumably he would acquire this piece, the teacher would acquire the piece and the kid said oh, I'm awfully sorry sir we're taught that archaeological things have to come from known excavations and must stay where they've been found <laughs> So he had the nerve, I mean, a 12-year-old to say that to a teacher is quite a cultural confidence. Um, uh, so I was trying to think of other things. So you asked about the environment and the situ more about the archaeology. Um, what was the other question? Well, <laughs> one, one thing I'd like to say, which I... Sorry, yeah, thank you. <laughs> how, how they saw themselves as fitting into the environment before they got this kind of archaeological discovery. Did they relate to their past, or did they... Would, I mean, is there a, an oral tradition? Um, no, <laughs> no. The, the knowledge of the past has come from archaeology. Okay. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Um, what I haven't talked about are problem areas. There are problems in Agua Blanca. There's always problems. In a small community, you will get um, an in crowd and an out crowd. You will get people who think that everything's in the hands of the committee members or whatever and, and, and who get a bit disgruntled. Um, one case in point was the, the swimming pool had originally been created as a, a tank for irrigation. But now, the horticulturists are only allowed to take water before 7 a.m. in the morning because the pool needs to be full, it's spring-fed, needs to be full for the tourists. And they were getting a bit annoyed about this. So the village paid money to have another well drilled further up the valley and a pipeline run to, to irrigate. Um, but they hadn't yet got the money for the pump to run it. And I found people who moaned about, oh, well, the water from the pool is now for the tourists, and how will we water the maize? Um, and I said, oh, you don't know, they've drilled, um, uh, they've drilled the pump further up the, the, the valley. Um, and when they get the money for the, for the pump, y you'll both needs for water will be... And they didn't know this. And it, the penny dropped is that the out crowd, the whingers, if you like, are self-selecting. They're the people who decide not to go to the monthly meeting, which is an exchange of information. It's where you discover things. Like. And th it's quite a dispersed village. It's not a dense town centre. It's a village of 40 families, but the houses are dotted in, in the bush uh, 
quite dispersed, so you may not see your neighbours for, for two or three days. So there was this tension of, um, oh, all the jobs go to the in crowd. But as I've, as I've explained, they've gone to lengths not to, to, to avoid nepotism, to avoid jobs for the boys, by having the rota for the houses, by having the rules about um, guiding team membership, etc. Um, and uh, another interesting case is that um, in other communities, the local authority, the village council in another village, has set up a, an arm's length independent semi-commercial organisation to run their tourism. They looked at this and said, no, we don't want that, we'll lose control. <laughs> it's going to be run by the archaeology committee of the Comuna. So they thought about these issues, about control. They, they've, they say they, they've told the large tourist companies they don't want to work with them, that if, if tourists come to the village, they want to be in charge of what happens to them. They don't want to be taken over by you know, um, the large international travel companies, etc. Sorry. Yeah. That's all interesting. Yes. It was very similar to the last question. But um, in, I'm an archaeologist and I'm all about um, identity and I like to think about our identity as archaeologists as we do it. And um, I'm interested because you said at the end they like to refer to themselves to the uh, pre-conquest kind of culture. And I was wondering, do you think the process of doing the archaeology helped decolonise their identity and to help, help them reclaim their, their, their indigenous kind of history? Without doubt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, did, you, did you see that? Did you see it? Or did you see the process of becoming? Well, over 25 years, I suppose I have. Um, that was why it was so rewarding to go back 25 years later and to see what's happening. Um, but I, even I hadn't expected <coughs> that degree of awareness. Nothing I haven't mentioned is that there is a national network in Ecuador for community tourism. Um, Agua Blanca, a, a guy from Agua Blanca is the chair, it's split up into three committees, Amazon, Sierra and Coast. The, a guy from Agua Blanca is the chair of the Coastal Committee. Um, I'm not aware if in Britain there is an organisation for, for community tourism. I think there might be, but I don't know of it. I know there's an organisation that looks after independent museums, but I don't know of a community tourism network. If anybody knows of one, I'd be interested to hear about it. Yes, Catherine. Thank you. Um, Catherine from the Institute for Sustainable Heritage. Um, were there particular individuals who were really crucial for this, like particular personalities that you think made this a success? Say like the village president or somebody, or is it really like this, you know, such a team effort? Um, um, without doubt, um, the, w uh, the previous village president when we built the museum was quite a character. He was a park ranger, actually, but he had the idea for the kids' minga and probably for the grown-up minga for the foundation building, digging. Um, the two leading lights when I was there, um, by coincidence or otherwise, were the two carpenters that Colin persuaded me to take on in the job I was doing on the coast previously. Mm -hmm. He said they really, they'd done some carpentry training, they would really like to come down and help you at Salango. So while I was employing carpenters, builders at, at Salango, um, we took them on as sort of apprentices. One is now the village president mm -hmm. and the other is the chair of the coastal network of, of community tourism. Um, and over the 25 years, I, I went back to find they were both widowed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the visit president actually said to me, he said, well, doing the, the work that being president brings me is a sort of, I've, I've got more time now because, I, you know, because I'm a widow. Mm -hmm. And I was quite touched by that. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other reasons for, for getting involved. Um, someone else who was a, a village guide and who was a teenager when I was first there, who's now probably f in his 40s, he consciously decided to become a park guide um, so that his place on the village guide committee would be free for someone else to use. Mm -hmm. um, so there are all these little anecdotes about people thinking collectively. And its history comes from the fact of this battle with the national park. They don't fight the National Park now. They, they go to each other for advice. 
The National Park, who used to build in breeze blocks and corrugated iron, is now building in timber, split bamboo and palm thatch, mm -hmm. which is quite nice to, to learn because they, they're cheaper materials, they're far more um, tolerant of the climate yes. than, than, than model, modern than cement and, and um, asbestos and things. Yeah. It seems to me like there is a strong <coughs> identity driver as well as an economic driver and I have developed this quite sustainable model. I, I'm just wondering what, uh, how do they deal with the long-term maintenance of of the objects or of their remains, like the overall, the long-term maintenance. Yep. Um, How do they do that? Part of the duties of being a guide, everybody has a machete, um, <laughs> is that, especially when it's, it's the off-peak season, is that part of your duties are to keep the weeds down on the archaeological site. Um, they also have built a store for all the finds. There's an awful lot of broken pottery um, as well as bone and as well as other items, a, s a small amount of metal and shell. Um, and they are developing a project to invite conservators in okay. to, to research their collections, but at the same time, uh, so they, they like people doing PhDs and things because it, it brings conservators, it brings um, cataloging, yes. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they're aware of the need when I was there, they, apart from wanting me to move back, mm. they, they said, we want more archaeologists. Mm. And they're aware that if there's a project going on in the village, it attracts attention, it tr attracts funding, right. and it attracts science. Mm. Um, so that, that's, yeah. That's very good. More questions? We also have the opportunity to continue the conversation. Yes, there is a last question. I'm uh, Amir I'm an architect from Egypt and I'm doing my PhD here. Uh, was there any opposition from the locals against the archaeology somehow that would they would find some things that are sensitive, they would like them to be dug out, like such as burial sites and things like that? Would they have any belief that would... Do you mean a, a human remains yeah, issue? Yeah, some of the human remains um, some things that they consider sensitive. Not really. Um, it, it, it might be more of an issue in Amazon communities, for instance, <laughs> but um, I wouldn't call the, village, the, the communities on the coast, I wouldn't call them indigenous. You're more likely to get those sort of values being expressed by purer indigenous communities. But these were integrated um, uh, communities uh, that... that didn't have, I mean, Agua Blanca was only, is only about 100 years old. It was, a, it was, it grew up around a hacienda that was for collecting tagua <coughs> palm, um, that, that, that was developed in the 19th century. I um, don't relate to the remains of the people buried that. They're that aware, that they're place. aware because of their noses yeah. <laughs> that, that they're their, their predecessors. But there's, I never heard of a sensitivity about human remains. I think they're respectful about them. They're all preserved in boxes. And they wouldn't just scatter them. Yeah. Um, but but it, it's, there's less sensitivity than you, you would find in more traditional communities. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you very much, Chris. That was really interesting. <laughs>